Welcome, welcome. Welcome back to another John Art with JB. Buongiorno. Como stai? Uh, hope you're all doing well. So what, what I'm going to be doing today is taking you through uh, my painting process again. You know, I, I finished um, the first in a series of several Isaac Asimov fan art pieces. This is the second uh, entry into that series. The first entry dealt with the um, novel foundation and it was basically Gal Dornick arriving on a terminus. And this is a Beta Durrell undercover on the planet Calgon, trying to dig up information on the mule. So what I'm doing is I'm actually uh, got a few uh, Padme cosplay references off the internet here. And I'm going to be just going through and painting her cape in and painting her uh, sort of retro futuristic tunic in today. I'll take you through a little bit of that process. So what I'm doing is just using the pen tool here. I rather like the pen tool. I think that uh, gives you a lot of flexibility as a creator. Uh, let's just go in. And yeah, so this will be the second draw stream that I'm doing. Uh, the last video di I did was a uh, Andrew Loomis tutorial on hands or basically integrating the Loomis method with, um, you know, how to draw hands correctly. So you can check out that video, how to draw hands. That's the previous video. If you go through my backlog, <laughs> I don't have that extensive of a back that backlog as of yet. Um, and what I'm doing here is I'm just trying to cut out just what I need for the reference. And typically when I'm painting from reference, just like if I were doing a traditional oil painting, what I would do is I would take my reference and I would tape it right next to uh, where I'm painting my subject on my gessoed board or panel. I typically work on gessoed panel. I know there are a lot of artists prefer um, cold press illustration boards sanded down or you know some, some artists prefer can, can't even canvas boards sanded down. Some artists prefer linen, you know, linen canvases. I think uh, the consensus among oil painters for canvas is that linen is the best because it has a, enough of a tooth where it will catch the paint and allow you to build coverage fairly easy, but not so much of a tooth where you can't get smooth modulation or buildup of impasto that's unintended. So, um, you know, buildup of texture, i.e. impasto, right? And sometimes uh, artists will purposely go for a look that employs impasto with the buildup of paint on the surface um, to create a texture. But more often than not, when you're doing illustrative work, if you're reproducing, you know, for digital or for it to be photo, photographed, you, you don't want to have uh, an excessive amount of impasto. So I imagine she's sort of racially ambiguous. And she's also, you know, it's a late in the day, so really the cinnamon, uh, on her face and, um, you know, some of the, the yellows and the <clears throat> ochres are being played up quite a bit here. Um, and like I said, she has a natural kind of cinnamon tint to her skin, being racially ambiguous. Uh, some artists that are a big influence on me, um, the famous Lucasfilm artist Hugh Fleming is a huge influence on me, as well as uh, Matt Stowicki, another great artist. Um, it need in terms of backgrounds and composition, even you know color palette, value structure, huge influence on me. James Gurney for it has been a very influential in terms of just you know I'm reading his book. Uh, what was it? Um, color and Light. So uh, that book has been very instructive, just reinforcing the um, principles of correct painting. So I rather like this. I think what I'm going to do at this juncture is minimize her, keep this here, and just try to keep track of my layers. My layers tend to pile up pretty quick. And you can see when I stack this up here, I've got a pretty good read on where things are going to go. So there's a lot of cream in this <clears throat> tunic, and I tried to work out a little tentative palette for my tunic here. When I The way I approach a painting palettes in digital is a little bit different from how I'd approach it in um, 
traditionally in the sense that if I were to, um, okay, so that's a color I want. So I'm actually gonna go to my second layer here. I'm gonna make a new layer and I'm just gonna go and I drop this. If I were approaching this in a traditional format, I would uh, strictly stick with a Zorn limited palette, uh, meaning I would, um, I wouldn't, uh, I would do four colors. So I would do cadmium red. I would do um, cad red, yellow ochre, black, white, and a uh, cobalt blue or cerulean blue, probably cobalt blue. And that would be my four four colors of the add-on, but the blue is an extra add-on. So uh, basically uh, with this is each section, I tried to do a four to five color palette for um, for that particular section still derivative of a Zorn limited palette, right? So, I mean, this you can all break down to a combination of red, black, and yellow ochre, all these colors, whereas this you're basically, it's yellow, black, and you're mixing uh, shades of um, white in there to desaturate and get chromatic grays. But I try to work out my palette first, and I try not to overuse the color picker because I feel like that is a way that to kind of quickly cripple your development if you're trying to keep your your chop sharp in terms of your color picking chops. Um, I rather like that. Let's go into let's go into more of a yellow key here. Yellow is an illuminant, so whenever you're trying to, you know, do something bright, you always want to, yeah, throw some yellow in there, and then again, white can desaturate and blend, so you want to be a little bit more um, judicious with your white in terms of just how much you're using exactly. <clears throat> We have these three colors down here. So what I really want is to have <clears throat> here are these colors. I always work off an underdrawing and I typically will do my sort my figure first. And then go to my background and work from the background until I hit my figure again. And then at that point, the painting has been completed. So that's that's generally how I work this. I work my magic. I'm just gonna erase these. I want these all in my painted layer here. So I hope everybody's enjoying the weather change. I know I am. <laughs> This would be my palette. So in, in this case, we can get rid of this one too. So I'm just adjusting here. And I just want to go down the line, right? I have a built-in gray line right here. This gray line, this end of this color picker is my gray line, which means that my color corresponds to whatever monochromatic black and white value I'm going to hit over here so I can I can just go down this gray line to, to find my colors again sort of like a built-in color picker in Photoshop which is highly highly beneficial to to have and you know you want to basically think about it that way um, see right there oh. I am playing music. No, we don't want to set up professional audio settings yet. I just want to cool that off, actually. So what I want to do is just come in here. Maybe hit this more towards green. Yep. 
get that warm and cool, right? So we have these hots are yellow. <clears throat> I've seen quite a bit of blue in here as well. Let's see, you also want to get Looks like a green shadow. So over here, we want to go back down the line, get more of a where that light's hitting. So this is my warm shadow, this is my cool shadow, this is my sort of neutral, and this is my white that I'm going to be using. So that's one, two, three, four, five color, uh, five hues there that I've derived from this color key. All right, in this case, now what I'm going to do is just see where all these colors are at. So I think what I'm going to do is just take this, lasso these items, copy them, delete them, and then take them, paste them right into this color key right here. And then just make sure that I haven't lost a step. Go to my history. And then the last thing I want to do is sort of reconcile where this green color is going to go. Let's move these two down. Well, there's some kind of hidden color there. What we'll do is we'll just throw our our marquee tool on it. Right. I want to just command S. In case Photoshop gets bratty on me, I don't have to reopen it again. <clears throat> All right, let's see where we're at here. I imagine we're uh, already at 124. So next thing I want to do is I just want to come in. I want to grab this color. I'm going to color over my reference again here. Oop. Let's go up here. So I'm thinking there's some room for some of this color up here, but <clears throat> you know, it's more of a middle ground. I don't want to invent shapes that and colors 
that don't exist. I want to keep things relatively simple. Like if you look at the shape relationships, relationships of my face here, things are blocked in in a fairly simple three-fourths lighting scheme. So I want to keep that sort of lighting scheme and I want to keep those shape relationships consistent throughout my painting. Um, and you also want to look at your work to scale. So if I flip this to actual size, that's the actual size of my work. And I also want to look at it in print size. So hypothetically, print size would be something like that, right? You know, you don't want to be looking at your work like this. You do not want to be doing that. You know, about here is fine. You can take advantage of the computer and zoom in if you like, but that's generally the, you know, how I would work it. And then here, what I'm going to do is just create a new layer above here. We'll call this cape. Call this face. Call this cape reference. And then save again, and then I'm ready to go. I, I typically will hit Command S quite a few times throughout the painting process here. And you can see I just kind of masked in a cape here, but um, I'll take some liberties with this. Just gonna go in. And I'm, I am gonna follow the contours of what I initially have here in terms of the shape of the cape. So, I'm going to nail down that silhouette. Just going right over everything here. No sweat. We would have a really cool dark. And I'm just kind of mixing and matching colors right now. And so if I zoom out, kind of get this little shape here. And I'm just ab living a little bit. And this video won't be too long. I'm just kind of laying in, you know, basic forms, basic shapes here. I'm going with, notice how I'm going with this more of a neutral cream going towards yellow color. When you're doing white, you know, you want to be aware of that. Um, and we have Mario playing in the background. Watching the 
history of Nintendo. Game history on YouTube. It's pretty cool. So I typically will put something like that on in the background as white noise while working. This color in here. I'd rather get this color in here. I'm doing the warm darks, but really what I want to do is throw some cool darks in here as well. Get that contrast between warm and cool going. Mm. Right. So especially in this area here, there's quite a few uh, warm and cool darks. And you can see I'm just basically drawing with the paint. I'm not really, you know, in this case, it's value um, as distilled through color. <clears throat> I don't know what that is. Hold on. Oh, okay. So we want to move this down. Let me do some layer reorganizing here. that I am not messing with anything that I painted over already. Or if those two layers down. Let's get rid of her for the time being. We don't need her. Where is this? So cape, face, right? Now this is all in the same layer. Let me just save. Let's check the time here. We're already at half an hour. Holy cow. <clears throat> so yeah, no, I'm really excited for the Apple TV series. Um, I know that they're coming out with a foundation Apple TV series, which I'm extremely excited about. And that's what inspired me to do these fan arts. And again, typically, you know, there's like these shots of blue, beautiful sort of cool blues playing off these yellows and creams in this cape, especially with regards to, you know, some of the forms and shapes that I'm seeing in here and the side of the cape where maybe that shadow is, you know, the light is bending around the, the figure and the form, but it's bending at the furthest most point towards us. So this cape receding into the distance is gonna be cooler as it's not really getting a direct, in the direct path of the light source. So I wanna cool this off a bit. Still wanna get as much of that neutral action going on as possible. So I'm actually gonna come back to my yellow neutral now. And again, they're uh, master painters that uh, I have to have the privilege and, and uh, the privilege and pleasure of knowing and uh, you know, also calling my colleagues as well that have their own YouTube channels and uh, you should check out Bill Graff, uh, Bill Graff Fine Art on YouTube. He is a master oil painter, extremely knowledgeable and has helped my development a great deal. Someone that's just working with him and being around him and um, I'll be painting something and he'll walk by my studio and say, hey, why don't you try this? Why don't you try that? 
so insightful and I've learned so much just from that sort of exchange uh you know being in being around other artists that have way more knowledge than you do and um experience as well and you know through working with these artists you're able to through osmosis that experience is imparted on you and there's a that there's an exchange of ideas there and so bill was one of these people that i worked with at the atelier and uh, he is a, a really nice youtube channel where he goes over you know a gray line and how to mix his own limited palette and really it's way more challenging to do this sort of thing traditionally. I mean, the computer has this built-in gray line here and you need to use it. And then not only that, it's a grid system. So you're taking like something like the Riley method and you're break, break, breaking it down into a color picker. Most people, most people who use the color picker are not aware of why the color picture picker in Photoshop is structured the way it is, but it's structured to function as a grid, right? So you have your gray line and your color going from light to dark, your corresponding color, just like you would in a Riley grid um, or, a gray, or a gray line for a Zorn limited palette. And you can do that to any color, right? And, but there's less setup and mixing and having to take into account drying times and paint mediums and whatnot. So that's sort of good to be aware of as you're using the color pickers. You know, I think having that sort of context prevents an artist from blindly just, you know, going crazy with the gamut of color and the color picker. Um, and then once you have your colors on your figure, then I'll go in and use the eyedrop tool. Or if I have my palette at that point, I look at it as like loading my brush, right? So just take the eyedrop tool here and then I go in. And I know this video is a little long winded and um, <laughs> at points probably disjointed, but it's because I sort of, it's one of those days where I'm just kind of moving in reverse, but trying to get a little painting in before I teach here. Now we'll see how the mixing brush uh, modulates these edges that I'm making because really I should be merging these layers if I'm gonna do this much of the figure beforehand so that it picks up some of this ochre in the background. This is essentially my gesso right here, but I'm gonna see if I can bypass that. I'm gonna see if the program will just let me get a smooth uh, gradation from light to dark with the values I have above the, the gesso for this particular cape. So around this, I am going to get, you know, like I said, some not quite done with getting can get a little bit of a dark over there. Oh, not, not as much as I might initially have envisioned. <clears throat> Something like that, maybe. You want to, again, keep it simple. I don't want to invent. I don't want to invent hues that don't exist, values that don't exist. I am going to get a little bit of these warm shadows over here, some bounce light. And I'll probably end up merging this and working in the gesso, uh, you know, now that I've had a moment to kind of sit here and ponder which way I should go. <laughs> um.
I see a little bit of this dark here, so maybe I want to come in and grab a little bit of that dark value. Yeah, you know, with Zorn, a lot of my shadows end up going green. This is the way my faces have kind of evolved over time. I like to, you know, have more of an earthy black, you know, to my faces. Some artists will really take advantage of the cools that you get blue to make their black. But unless it's like a certain type of sunset, I tend to uh, keep it green. So I'm just looking at this from far away now generally like it you know i think i'm gonna have to bring this flesh tone down and work it in i'm going to add some more shadows over here some more warm shadows and again this is more of a casual draw stream as opposed to a tutorial i do have tutorials um in my back catalog as well and i plan on making way more tutorials but this is just sort of a video that you know when i'm feeling a painting and sharing what i'm doing in a very casual sense this is the sort of the whole idea behind a draw stream right and eventually i'll be doing live streams in fact maybe um after i complete my move i'll uh, i'll start doing some live streams so i will be making a formal announcement um i plan on relocating to vermont so that's been First and foremost in my mind for some time, it's just, you know, when doing a formal, hey, I'm moving announcement, it just, you know, it never seemed like there was a right time to do that. So, um, but I think that the time is coming where I should be making a formal announcement pretty soon, just to let everybody know what my plans are in that regard. I do plan just as an FYI to continue teaching online. So if you're a current student of mine and you're listening, don't fret, don't fear, I'm still gonna be here in online form. So I know that I've told a few of my students already, but there will be some people that are going to be a little caught by surprise when I make that announcement. And um, again, I don't want people fretting or getting despondent because really I do very much plan on still working with the atelier and um, the other institutions that where I currently teach. I'm planning on continuing the relationship with those schools just in a purely online capacity. And, um, you know, life is all about change and growth, right? And it's one of those serendipitous points, right? With, uh, you know, especially in light of everything that we went through as a society last year, where, you know, certain things are put in perspective and I ended up getting engaged. And uh, from there, you know, life will start throwing changes at you really quick because that's a big commitment when you decide to get engaged in that. There are certain things that come with that commitment, right? You're not just thinking about yourself, but you're a couple now. And so my fiance got a job up in Burlington, Vermont. Which I'm very excited about, you know, and a little trepidations about, but um, I think, you know, overall more excited than anything else. And I know it's going to be an adjustment for me, but I'm optimistic and I'm going in with the glass half full attitude, right? And really trying to, Embrace um, this new chapter that I'm starting in my life. I uh, just this little background about me. I am a born, I'm a New Yorker, born and bred, and I've really my whole life been in New York. I've traveled abroad, and I do like to travel, but that was much later on in my 30s when I started really traveling abroad. Um, most of my life, in my formative years growing up, I was really in that. New York tri-state area. I've been here my entire life and I've very much become a creature of habit in a lot of ways, very much used to how things are here. So it, it change can be a little 
for someone with my temperament, right? Sometimes change can be a little hard to adapt to, but I think it's important that we throw ourselves out of our country comfort zone and embrace the, the challenges and rewards that come our way with, you know, with life and um, embrace change is something that is to be expected and, you know, relished, not feared. It's a healthy way to look at life. So I think I've got pretty good base here. Um, at this point, what I want to do is just look at this from far away. View, actual size. And what I'm going to do is I'm not going to go too crazy with the texture. I'm going to cut this video soon. But um, when I come back for another draw stream, you'll see that I have this texture all sort of worked out here. What I'm going to do for now, though, is just focus on getting these base forms masked in. So I have this nice, cool blue down here that I want to just get in. And again, here as well. <clears throat> and you can see how these color relationships really inform, you know, the um, inform the viewer's eye. So you can even go again, we can go down the gray line and, and more of a blue key here. And I can like manipulate and shift at my leisure, really what I want to do. And And let's look at it from far away. Let's view actual size. Again, go down that value scale. See, it's way too dark. This looks actually looks pretty close. So I want to keep that there and add a little bit of that value maybe back over here. All right, let's command S. Always want to step save. That's what I tell my digital students. And then what I want to do is uh, look at this actual size here. And I'm just checking the time on the relaxing Nintendo list uh, music playlist here. I'm at 44, or so and I've rambled on quite a bit. But yeah, no, I like it so far. It's a good, this is a good sort of first pass to just, you know, nail down the values at this point. I would mix this in. Typically, again, I would probably, once I get this cape sorted, I'm going to go and sort my sky. I'll get some good photo reference for that. And then we'll go from there. I suppose what I could do, though, is I could actually, um, you know, let's go in and just merge this down. Let me just make sure that. I'm not hitting anything up here. Push these push down. There we go. Save again. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to take a quick sip of my coffee here. Go over the mixer brush a little bit with you guys. So, the mixer brush, Photoshop, it's a very valuable tool. And what it does is it helps simulate the painted edge, specifically with regards to oil painting. You can really simulate that nice modulated edge that you would get. In an oil painting or even a you know a smooth tight acrylic painting um so what i do is i'll clean the brush and you load it just like you would an actual brush i have my palette over here right so what i want to do is just you know i try to start off with a neutral so i'm going to start off with this neutral and i have a texture here a texture brush that i rather like so i have this sort of chalk brush um and i again i look at a lot of the work of guys like drew screws and hugh fleming for my figurative for how i approach my figures they work with color pencil and um, airbrush, acrylic airbrush, and they have a very textured look to their work because of how they integrate the colored pencil and how they make it work synergistically with the acrylic. So there is 
quite a bit of, of a painterly look to their work if you look at the faces up close. And when you look at them from far away, the faces tend to tighten up, right? If you're painting, if you're taking into account scale and trying to paint to scale, right? Um, you should always, again, have your work in traditional painting. You wanna paint one-to-one -one at the scale it's gonna be viewed at, right? So you, in digital, if you wanna bend that rule a little bit, you can, you can zoom in a little bit, but I would still have like sort of, I would still stay, stay fairly far out. Like maybe here is the most I would typically wanna zoom in. And then you still want to every few minutes or so be going to view actual size to see how your things read as they're intended to look in printed, you know, in, 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 you know, in an actual size format or, and also if it's going to be reduced down for, 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 for a specific print run, you want to just try and get a sense of that too. So this would be close to paperback size. Not that... And now, not that paperbacks may or may not be around too much longer, but hopefully they will be. I, there's something magical about reading a book, right? Um, so I'm actually going to come in here, toggle my brush size. I, I use the brush settings a lot, and I'm just going to go and apply a light amount of pressure. And really, This, this textured chalk brush really simulates that sort of airbrush acrylic look because it has a little bit of a roughness to it. Gives you a little bit of a tooth and a brush stroke, but it's not it's still fairly smooth. It, blur, it blurs your forms just enough to give a believ, believable gradation of light and dark with regards to how your edges are transitioning from one shape to another but it doesn't like blend it so that it's so silky smooth that it looks super way commie, right? Um, in my opinion, I mean, and there's different, you know, obviously different painters have different sort of strong suits. Some painters are natural renderers, some are natural drawers, you know, and where they, um, they're going in And uh, clean this up. I want to start with that neutral. So I was working that that highlight a little bit, but now I want to come back in and just really work this neutral. or even maybe work this dark a little bit. Get more of a sort of believable transition. Some of this gesso will shine through a little. All right, and then we'll look at it from far away. View actual size, <clears throat> so it's not too bad. I can always go in and add some highlights to this. You don't want to go too much to either extreme when you're trying to blend your edges. You always want to try to blend from the neutral. But 
or even from the dark. So you want to commit to your darks. That's something that a lot of artists don't do either. They don't commit to their darks and uh, shows, you know, you want to always be committing to those darks. Change the direction of the brush up a little bit. Do actual signs. And then for the white, I'm actually going to go in over this with another pass of white to get these textures, these ribs, these ribbed um, forms. If I go and clean this up again a little bit. Let me just finish uh, blending this over here and then I'll cut the video. So we are at, let's see, 54. And you can even increasing the size of your brush here will give you some more coverage, help you fac facilitate getting faster coverage on your piece. I'm actually going to be coming off of this fairly quickly off of this brown area in my gesso. And so that's going to most likely to, you know, have some sort of effect on how these colors are blending. It's making the blending go a little quicker. So. And for my neutral. Tomorrow I'll be putting up another tutorial.
And I rather like that so far. Let's just go to view actual size. It's not too shabby. Not too shabby at all. <clears throat> Here I am kind of zooming in a little bit just to get a greater sense of swarms are going together. All right, almost done there. Got a little bit of a rim light here. <clears throat> and again, I can go in and sort of ab lib this a little bit, add some more blues where I, as needed. There's a significant amount of blue, you know, down here, I think there's a little bit of blue, but generally this is going pretty much in the right direction. So. What I'm going to do is zoom out and say goodbye to you guys. I'm going to cut this now, but until next time, ciao, arrivederci, and thank you for joining me today for another draw stream. All right, take care.